When Mussolini came to power in Italy in 1922, he promised to modernize the country. The motor car offered the perfect symbol of modernization. With the development of Italian cars, he would put Italy in the front rank of advanced countries. He called on Italy's motor companies to help create his vision of a car-owning society. At the Lingotto factory in Turin, the Fiat company started to mass-produce cheap cars. From the ground floor, the production line wound upwards inside the building. specially built track. The Italian flair for design and the love of the motor car produced some beautiful and practical vehicles. Fiat Prosper. In the 1920s, there was no better way of popularizing these newly produced motor cars than to race them on public roads. Italy was already the home of one great road race, the Targa Florio. It was an enormously popular event in Sicily. It had been the idea of a wealthy Palermo merchant, Count Vincenzo Florio, who was first held in 1906. But the Targa Florio was run in the barely populated mountains of Sicily. What was needed was a race in the more populous north of the country. The answer was the Mille Miglia, the thousand miles that became the classic road race of all time. The Mille Miglia started in 1927. It was an idea of four friends of mine. It was Count Maggi, Count Mazzotti, Castagneto and Canestrini. They decided to make one race, it should have been only one, because it was a real madness. And then Mussolini sent a cable the next day saying, Si ripeta, it means do it again. Hundreds of thousands of people had turned out to see the cars as they raced along the roads of northern Italy. So the Mille Mille became an annual event. The Mille Mille was open to amateurs and professionals. By the 1950s, hundreds of drivers were taking part, the humblest of saloons competing against the latest racing sports models. My wife said, uh, <laughs> I'm coming too, so you won't do anything stupid. So we set off. At the beginning, my wife was terrified, because to go off in this car, even though it was a Fiat 500 and didn't go very fast, but uh, uh, with your foot right down on the accelerator all the time, uh, and we had hopes. Every now and again, my wife looked behind us, saying, no one's catching up with us. I looked ahead instead and said, but we're not catching up with anyone. And the Italians are funny people. They were mad about motor racing. So they'd put up signposts to warn you that there was a dangerous place. But of course, by the time you got there in the race, the crowd had all pulled the signposts down, thrown them into a field somewhere. And when you got there, they'd all become waving on like mad. And you think, well, I must be going rather slowly. And you go barreling over the top of the hill, and suddenly you find you over the road disappear to the right. And people go end over end into sort of fields and catch fire. And the crowd loved it, but it wasn't, you know, it's just the ideal sort of thing for a driver. The reputation of the Mille Miglia grew outside Italy. In 1955, Mercedes-Benz entered a team of 300 SLR racing sports cars with a strong team of drivers. We wanted to win Mini Mania for the reputation we were getting in Italy. We wanted to sell cars there. So we practiced a lot. I drove around several times. I liked it very much. It was fun. Fangio hated it because he couldn't drive at top speed down the road, which seemed to be blocked, 
by our mothers. Fanjo hated that. Sterling Moss didn't seem to care. And Sterling Moss said, I can't remember the whole road. I'm going to have a co-driver with Jenkinson. Jenks and I decided the only way to, to go fast on this road was to take everything that we thought could be a hazard. In other words, blind brows when we didn't know what they were, corners you couldn't see around, things like that, and give a signal. Jenks would give me a signal like that means flat out, that's slow, that's much slower, that's right, you know. And so we put these all, all these notes down on, on a piece of paper about 20 metres long, and then he ran this thing in front of him. We'd come over a, a brow at very high speed, he'd just say flat out. And of course the Italians, uh, they'd all lean to see down the road, you know, and, and so you're driving at a, at a funnel of people like that. I mean, you know, these speeds is, is and I mean, I just waggle the steering a bit, so things like this, the people say, Christ, he's out of control and pull out of the way. I mean, I remember going along a fast, straight piece of road and with a twin-engined aircraft. Well, now, they do 140 miles an hour in those days, and we were just overhauling this thing and pulling away. I mean, it was, it was a, a, quite, quite a staggering sort of event. Sterling Moss won the race for Mercedes, breaking the record in spectacular fashion. <laughs> The Melia Melia, this the, the year that I won it, uh, which was an average of 98.98 miles an hour, uh, took 10 hours, 7 minutes, 4 seconds, I think, or maybe 4 minutes, 7 seconds, I forget which it was, but it, it luckily can't be beaten now. It can't be beaten because the Melia Melia was banned two years later. It had been a dangerous race for some time, but it took a tragedy to end it, an accident involving the Spanish driver Alfonso de Portago. In 57, De Portago pinched a tire at Mantua on a curb so that the front wheel exploded while he was driving at 120 miles per hour. And then there were about 10 or 15 people who were killed. And then the thing that was a madness itself, and that had been repeated 24 times a miracle, had to be stopped. Road racing on the scale of the Mille Miglia had become just too dangerous. In Britain, road racing had never been allowed on the mainland, but in Northern Ireland during the 1950s, a circuit of public roads at Dundrod was used for the tourist trophy. Well, I think Dundrod was the most dangerous circuit I've ever raced on. It was narrow, the cambers were all wrong, uh, it's the part of Ireland where it's continuously raining, uh, the surface wasn't that good. I got a pit signal to come in earlier than I should. And I was so delighted and I was so happy, I couldn't wait to get to the pits. And in the process, I lost it going over one of the bridges there and wrote the car off completely. That's the only time I've ever shunted and damaged an Aston Martin. A lot of drivers killed there, three in one race, one of the TTs. Um, they should never have allowed motor racing there, and today they wouldn't be allowed to run a race there. Fortunately, no spectators were killed, but the deaths of three drivers showed how dangerous it was to race powerful cars on ordinary roads. In spite of the danger, the 1955 race between Sterling Moss for Mercedes and Mike Hawthorne for Jaguar showed why spectators loved it. Mike Hawthorne was, uh, was a great uh, character. I mean, he was um, an extrovert, um, a tremendous personality, uh, uh, larger than uh, life. A boy's own type uh, character, you know, of, of how a racing driver should be. A shock of uh, blonde hair, always wore a, a, a bow tie and usually a flat cap and with a sort of a bit of a, a V in the peak. The opposite of Sterling, really, in his approach to, to motorsport and um, he would see nothing unusual about having a pound of beer the night before the race, whereas Sterling uh, would um, be very ab abstemious and be thoroughly prepared physically and mentally for, for the race. The Tourist Trophy, as part of the World Sports Car Championship, was an important race to win. Mike Hawthorne went into the lead at the start, with Sterling Moss lying third. I'd won, I think, I don't know, four three or four tourist trophies, and I wanted to win that very much. The uh, Dundrod circuit was a very demanding circuit, quite narrow, and Mercedes was quite a big car, potential certainly of winning it. The great thing about the Mercedes was, quite honestly, uh, unless you went off the road, 
you could win or be second to Fangio because the cars were that reliable. I mean, we did not have any trouble with it, with the SLRs at all. Each car had two drivers. When Mike Hawthorne came into the pits for a routine handover, Moss opened up a substantial lead before coming into the pits himself. I'm going along and suddenly a, a tread peeled. Now, a very rare thing that treads used to peel right off like a banana. I'd never had it before on the Mercedes. Anyway, that ripped off the back wing. We had to go in and waste some time on that. Replacing the wheel cost Moss two minutes, and while the Mercedes was in the pits, Jaguar took the lead again. It was a gripping race. As the lead continued to change, the result was uncertain. Then it rained. Moss's skill at driving in the wet was a deciding factor. Dundrod's one of my favourite circuits because of the sort of circuit it is. It's demanding, it is a bit dangerous, it is always wet there, which I don't particularly like that much, but it is. But it is the sort of circuit that I can sort of cope with. It was a good circuit for Mercedes, for myself, and, and the 55 TT was, was very important to me. Moss won the race and would go on to win the Targo Florio in Sicily and the 1955 World Sports Car Championship for Mercedes. But the deaths that year put an end to racing at Dundrod. The age of the epic road races was drawing to a close. More and more were being banned because of the increasing danger to drivers and spectators alike. The oldest race was the last to go. After nearly 70 years, the final Targa Florio was held, severing the only remaining link with the heroic age of motor racing. To the end, it produced heroes for the Italian fans, drivers like Nino Vaccarella, a Palermo schoolteacher who won it twice for Ferrari. In 1973, the Targo Florio had finished in triumphant style. Three quarters of a million people had turned out to see the last race. Today, the grandstand lies empty. The Targo Florio has passed into motor racing history. The great road races have gone, but one branch of the sport has outlived them all, hill climbing. In England at Shelsley Walsh, Worcestershire, drivers have been competing since 1905. At Prescott, not far away, they also keep the tradition alive. In hill climbing, the drivers are on the road alone, pitting their cars against the hill and the clock. Many of the cars are veterans of other, more exalted forms of racing, enjoying a second career in hill climbing. For some drivers, hill climbing was a good place to start a career in racing. I went to Prescott, and uh, my first event there, actually, I think I was third, which, which I was pretty happy about. I mean, I'd never driven anything in a competition before. I can remember just thinking, well, I'm on the line and you're, you know, you're like this and, and then the flag fell and you've got, the first thing you're concentrating on is a good getaway because in, in a hill climb it really matters. You've got to get not too much wheel spin, virtually none, go away and then I think, well, I'll now break as late as I can, that's about all. And I'll steer here and there, but, but nothing more than that. I learned an enormous amount from two things, I think, at the very beginning. One was the Cooper, obviously, because it was a forgiving car, a good car, a responsive type of car, and B from hill climbs. I think hill climbs are a very good place for people to start, because on a hill climb, there's nobody else to 
to try and make you do something that perhaps you haven't the capabilities of doing. In other words, if you're going in a race and a car comes past, you think, gosh, I'm as quick as he is, and you try and follow him, well, maybe the guy who passed you was a, was a, was a latent fan here. You don't know this. And going in a hill climb, you go into a corner and you drive it as you see it. You brake when you want to brake. There's nobody sort of suggesting you can go quicker or more slowly or whatever. And you use the road as much as you want and so on. And so I think it's a very good place for people who are starting to, to get, cut their teeth. The hill at Prescott is almost three quarters of a mile long, and even novices manage to get up it in under a minute. In the United States, there's a hill climb which puts most of the others in the shade, Pikes Peak in Colorado. 14,000 feet of challenging snow-capped rock. Along sheer walls and high stone cliffs, a steep and winding roadway has been blasted into the mountaintop. Here is a natural testing ground, and what a testing ground. And they're off. Hammett is over the mark first, closely followed by Shimino, and then by Schultz. Oh, look at those boys dig in on the turn. The first race to the clouds was run in 1916. The climb winds 12 miles to the mountain summit over 14,000 feet above sea level. Pikes Peak has been called Unser's Mountain after one of America's great racing families, the Unser's, who've raced there for three generations. I've driven in all of the races up here except one since 1926. I've won the race nine times and I think I've had more fun up here than anybody that's ever been on this hill. The family's long association with Pikes Peak gave Louis's nephew, Bobby Unser, an intimate knowledge of the road. I know the road so well. I know practically every turn, every little rock that there is up here at Pikes Peak. In fact, uh, I can lay in bed at night and go over every turn, every straightaway, everything that there is up here, and I think that helps tremendously. The driving technique has been passed on to Bobby's son, Robbie Unser. The condition of the road, it's a loose granite gravel that's very slippery, and uh, you have a hard time getting side bite and forward bite with the car. And it's one of those deals you never stop sliding. You're kind of careful, <laughs> you know. I mean, Pike speak, you've got to find the limits, but you can't go over them. It's a place that you race against yourself. It's, it's not a race against another car. You don't have to pass another guy. You don't have to set him up or, you know, race him. It's you and the mountain, and it's, it's time. So you got to be a very disciplined driver and a very smooth driver in order to be successful up here. In the 1980s, there was a challenge to the American domination of Pikes Peak. Champion rally drivers from Europe arrived with cars specially built to go fast on rough terrain. The French company Peugeot prepared their car with four-wheel drive and four-wheel steering for the mountain. As he set out to break the record, the Finnish driver Ari Vatanen faced treacherous conditions towards the summit. Very difficult to describe to an outsider because to an outsider you are a bit of a lunatic to do it, but um, once you are in the, in the sport um, and you feel you're on top of it, uh, it's great. One twenty kilometer thrust to the 14,000 feet uh, with no barriers, uh, with the really deep drops uh, occasionally. And the car is very, very fast. I mean, about the same speed as Formula One car. And it's all or nothing. There's no uh, space for error at all. And, and if you uh, miss your one braking or you brake too early, you know that uh, you are hardly likely to win it. In 1988, Ari Vatanen broke the record in the race to the clouds at an average speed of 70 miles an hour. <laughs> a 
as well as creating one of the highest hill climbs, America also produced one of the longest road races. As in Britain, road racing has never been allowed in the United States. Then in 1950, an opportunity for American drivers occurred right on their own doorstep in Mexico. The Mexican section of the Pan American Highway from Alaska to Cape Horn was finished that year. To celebrate, the Mexican government allowed a road race from one end of the country to the other. The Carrera Panamericana soon captured the imagination of drivers and public. The drivers did best that were very good at high-speed driving on the roads and could visually size up a situation and get through it. You never got a chance to really learn the road like you can the Targa Florio or the Nürburgring. As long as they are, you can at least learn those circuits uh, well. And uh, in this, you could never, you could learn pieces of it. Like from the Puebla to Mexico City, you could learn that like the back of your hand. But the whole length of it, you just really could not get to know it that well. That you could be sure that you weren't going to goof up somewhere. Like the Mili Milia and the Targo Florio, it was immensely popular with spectators. They turned out in their thousands along the route. And like the Mili Milia, the enthusiasm of the spectators to get near the cars put an end to it. In 1954, after five races and many casualties, the Mexican government banned it. Denied the opportunity to race on the roads, American enthusiasts looked to their big open spaces instead. In the 1960s, a new form of off-road racing was conceived down the Baja Peninsula in Mexico. One of its stars was a driver who had attempted the land speed record, Mickey Thompson. The Baja races are run over hundreds of miles of the roughest terrain ever used for motor competitions. The cars are specially built for the desert conditions. It was fun to drive and exciting to watch, but only the hardiest of spectators made it far down the route. We ran a race, and I was co-driving with my dad. At the time, I wasn't allowed to drive, but I, I could ride with him, which was absolutely scary, I'm here to tell you. As he's driving the race car, I'm going, it's incredible, it's incredible, you can't believe what he just did. And from that point on, my dad started saying, we have to have people see this. Because in the middle of Baja, you're at a disadvantage for letting anybody see, because the only people that are out there are a few locals and we got a lot of snakes, rabbits, uh, and that's about it. Some birds, nobody can see it. So my dad's saying right then, we gotta have people see this. We gotta have people see this. And there it is, we, the rest of the race, that's all he kept saying. He had absolutely lost concentration on racing because he came up with a new revolutionary idea. That idea was to bring Baja racing into the Los Angeles Olympic Stadium. His approach was direct. Hi, my name's Mickey Thompson. I have this great idea. I want to take your beautiful field down there where those Olympics have been held, and I want to bring plastic, put plastic over your field. 
Then I want to bring 1,100 sheets of plywood and put plywood over your field. Then I'm going to bring 25 million pounds of dirt in here, and I'm going to make jumps and bumps, and I'm going to create my own chunk of Baja. And then down there on the one end of the Coliseum, I want to run the race cars right up through the bleachers, around your famous Olympic torch, and back into the stadium floor. And then I'm going to put 60,000 people in here to watch it. I mean, this guy, he's staggered, you know, he's going, wow, this is impossible. But Mickey Thompson did it, and a new form of racing was born. It was a long way from the tradition of the great road races, but it was competitive and fun for the drivers. It was safe, and above all, it was tailor-made for the spectators. The average person's attention span is between seven and 10 minutes. So rather than have a race that's three or four hours long where people get bored and get up, my dad made every race be seven to 10 minutes. Then people can get up, they can get their peanuts, their hot dogs, their beers, whatever they want, and you have another race in three to four minutes after that. So the way our format works right now for the Mickey Thompson Entertainment Group is, is we have 18 separate races in a three hour period. We've never had anybody serious with her. The cars go upside down, and unlike other forms of racing where usually when you go upside down, it's an absolute tragedy, our cars are actually built to go upside down. So when they go upside down, there's about six or seven horse workers that run out there. They roll the cars back over. A lot of times you don't even shut the engines off, and you go right back out and race again. So it, that's, that's what makes it so exciting. This is a no holes barred go for it type of sport. Now it's one of the most popular forms of racing there is in the United States. The men who competed in the Mille Miglia would scarcely see the connection between their achievements and Mickey Thompson's circus. But for the spectators in the Los Angeles Olympic Stadium and those who once lined the route of the Targo Florio, the excitement remains the same.